We thank you for the opportunity, Father, to hear your word. And the Father God rightly divide the truth. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that everyone that is here, Lord, that they would, as Brother Wells said earlier, that they are hungry and thirsty for your word. Because Lord God, that's the only way that things truly change in us is when we are continuously hungry and thirsty, we will be filled with your word, with righteousness, Lord God. Help us to understand what we are dealing with today and help us to be accountable and responsible for every word that comes forth out of our mouth. Lord, I ask and I thank you in advance that Lord, everyone here and everyone viewing this message in the future will receive and in receiving, Father God, they will grow. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. Today, as I said earlier, I'm going to continue and finish the message that the Lord had given me. It's not this Sunday, but the Sunday before. I was supposed to complete it Wednesday of last week, and then we had the storm, and I wasn't able to complete it. Uh, the Lord well told me, I want you to complete it. Because there's some things in here that you need to hear. And I'm pretty sure by now most of you have even forgotten what you heard uh, the Sunday before concerning empty words produce empty results, but God's word doesn't. So that's the name of the message that we continue on today. It's called Empty Words Produce Empty Results, but God's word doesn't, and it is continued. And brothers and sisters, as always, I welcome you here to share in God's word. And I pray that each and every one of us take the word personally for ourselves. Don't think about somebody else needing the word. You take it for yourself. And Lord, I ask and I thank you in advance, Lord, that your goodness and your mercy is towards all people. And I pray even more so, Lord, that you continue to draw us, your redeemed blood-bought children, your bride closer to you than ever before, <clears throat> starting right now. Keep our minds, enable our minds to stay focused on you and you alone. Remember our previous reading, uh, the Sunday before last, was found in Luke 6, 46 through 49, which I asked a simple question, which I still think that is a very straightforward question that Jesus asked then that cannot be denied and demands the same answer that he asked then. And that's when he well said, why call ye me Lord, 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 and do not the things which I say? He was just point blank asking the people that followed him, the people that called him Lord. He was saying, listen, if you call me Lord, then what he was saying, if you call me Lord, Lord, that means that you are willing to obey what I say. But he said, you're not. And that's what he was saying. And then he gave us a comparison to those who do and those who don't. And what happens to those who don't. Now the thing is this, he's talking about two builders, but he's always talking about two, the pro and the con. He's always talking about the night, the, the darkness and the light. It's always a comparison, always an alternative. And when he's talking about that, he is not talking about the world. He's talking to those who say, Lord, Lord. He's talking to us who call him Lord, but yet we don't think it's necessary to do the things he says to do. And what happens is when we don't, you may say, well, Pastor, you're pre preaching to the choir. Well, my answer to that when people tell me that is simply this. There's no better place that, Hayden, that Satan likes to hide but in the choir. So let me speak to you guys. And if Satan is, is standing here anywhere, then he can hear a mouthful as well. Amen? So when you say, when you and I say, Lord, 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 God is actually saying, well, why do you call me Lord? If you're not willing to do what I tell you to do. And then he well says, he well says that what happens when you don't, one is compared to a wise man and one's compared to a foolish man. And that's what he says. He says, and why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings, and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house, and digged deep, and laid the foundation on a rock, and when the flood arose, challenges arose, tribulations arose, whatever it may be that came against him, and they're talking about your home, 
Your home is your life. It's not your building. It's your life. It says it beat strongly upon that house, but it could not shake it. Why? Because those who said, Lord, Lord, did what he told them to do. So it couldn't shake it, not because of us, but because of whom we obeyed. When you call the Lord, Lord, it means that you've made him, you're the one that covers you, that protects you. He's the one that tells you what to do to be protected. He's the one that says, if you do what I tell you to do, no matter what comes against you, it will not bring you down. He did not say things will not come against you. He said, when you do what I'm telling you to do, no matter what comes against you, will not bring you down. That's his promise. And it's almost uh, parallels to what Isaiah said, too. When he said that no weapon formed against you will prosper, he was saying the same thing. He said, I'm not telling you that weapons are not formed against you, but those weapons that are formed against you will not prosper with the same condition for those who serve you, the servants of the Lord. It parallels exactly what Jesus was saying also in the New Testament. Amen. It goes on to say here that... It could not shake it. Uh, verse 30 or 49 of that passage, it says, But he that heareth and doeth not, here's your comparative, here's your contrast. And it all has to do with choice. Choice. The thing here that really is so powerful and yet so simple is everybody he's speaking to hears. What makes the difference is what they do with what they hear. And again, that is choice. Now you either apply it or you don't. And when you don't apply what he tells you to do, then you leave an open door. Even though you have God's promises, you become legal turf to the enemy. You hear what I'm saying? Amen. You see, you and I need to be in that place of legality. In legality, no matter what people say, I don't want to hear nothing about legalism. I'm not talking about legalism. I'm talking about rightfully being in a place of heritage, servant of the Lord. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, that no weapon formed against them will prosper. And that's what I'm talking about. That's what this says, and I say empty words produce empty results, but God's word doesn't. How does that apply to us? Well, when we say, Lord, 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 and we don't do what he's saying, then those words, Lord, 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 are actually empty words. Even though that's not our text, that reading is a foundational reading. And as it was my intention last uh, Sunday before last, I think it was March the 27th, was to remind us and it is to remind us today of the gravity or the seriousness that's attached to calling the Lord Jesus Lord. Jesus made it very clear right up front concerning anyone that says that he is Lord of their life. And that's what I'm doing right now is to remind us. You know, the Word of God did say that, didn't he? In Isaiah 54, 17, about no weapon formed against us. But what about... What we read in Matthew, for instance, 7, 21 through 24. What was Jesus saying then? Was he not saying the same thing? See, the word of God says in Matthew 7, 24, uh, 21 through 24, look what Jesus again says. Well, and again, you say, well, Pastor, why are you sharing this? I mean, I love the Lord, I obey him. I'm sharing this with you because we are all challenged with certain things in our lives that we need to be really understanding that what you don't deal with, Satan will. He will exploit you. Even though you love the Lord, even though you, you know, you're saved, he'll still exploit you. He will find a legal avenue to take that covenant promise, whether it be your healing, your peace, or whatever, and he will... He can't steal it from you unless you give it to him, but he can put his hand around it so that you can't sense it, so you can't feel it. 
Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know that, you know, the peace of the Lord is for you. You're a believer. But for some reason, that peace, you can't feel it. Why? Well, you have to ask yourself, am I stepping, am I doing something that kind of allows Satan to put his hand on my heart so I can't feel that? Am I angry at someone? Do I have unforgiveness at someone? Uh, have, have I started to say things that sound just like the world? Am I reacting more like the world than responding? Well, then you are becoming legal. You have given Satan legal access to you, to that peace that God has given you. The Word of God says that I have given you peace, not of the world given. I give you my peace. Let not your heart be troubled. So when we are in a place of reacting like the world, our old nature, what happens? The peace that we know belongs to. And how many of you know what I'm talking about? You felt peace when that peace, I mean, no matter what's coming at you, there's a peace God gives you. But you've also felt at times when you should be feeling that peace, you don't. So why? Has God withdrawn from you? No. You've done, I've done the same thing many times. The same thing that Job did. The thing that we fear the most has come upon us. Because there's something hidden there that we don't quite trust God with. And God says he wants us to trust completely everything he has. Don't let your word, when you say Lord, Lord, Lord. You and I have to learn that he's the Lord of what you see and what you don't see. Of what you feel and what you don't feel. When you speak something unto the Lord, when you declare those things unto the Lord, Satan is listening. He is. And he wants to find out if there is a place there when you say, Lord, 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 that truly, truthfully, you have not allowed God to be the Lord in that area. Anybody kind of give the drift that I'm talking about? Amen. And this is just a broad spectrum of it. I want to get in a little bit of detail, and I don't want to run out of time. I remember our our text from that teaching was found in verse 25 of 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 25. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but I'm going to read the, the very first verse, verse 13, and then I'll go right into the text verse. It says here in verse 13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Are you all with me? I gave this all to you, March the 27th, Sunday before last. So you should have it. That's why I'm not going to put all this time going over it again. Because we lose too much ground. The Word of God says here in verse 13 of 1 Peter chapter 1, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Are you all with me? Amen. Now, I want you to go down to the very text verse, or key verse. It says, But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. And what I'm saying today in this message is what I'm sharing with you is not my word, not my opinion, but the word of God. But that word, in order for it to do what it needs to do in you, you need to gird up the loins of your mind. You need to be sold. You need to understand that the word of the Lord endure forever, but whether or not it endure forever or not in your heart is not dependent upon me, it's dependent upon you. When that word that you say that you've received in your heart, that you speak out or you share with somebody else, if it is not the word of God, but contrary to the word of God, if your anger besets you, if your frustration begets you, even though you heard the word of God, the word of God that you heard becomes empty in you, even though the word of God is not empty. The word of God says, give Satan no place. Well, how do we give him place? Can he read your mind? No, but he can hear what you say. When we say, Lord, 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 and he says, don't let the, your anger get the best of you. And you react the same way that the world reacts. Then you have a love. Even though the word of God says, do not give Satan any place. 
when he says that, he also enables you to know that you don't have to give Satan in place. And if you read that in Ephesians, the way that you don't is by putting on the new man. So when we give Satan that place, we have made the word of God empty in our lives. We say, Lord, Lord, Lord. And he says, but you haven't done what I said to do. So therefore, when the storms come against you, when the things come against you, you wonder why your house is shaking. You wonder why all of a sudden they've got a little bit of something that got in that shouldn't have got into your life. It robbed you of your joy. It robbed you of your peace. Well, where did that come from? The word of God says that, he says, my peace I give unto you not as the world give. Well, where happened? Is his word void? No. So where did his word become empty? Is his word empty? I want to know that. So where does that word, the power of God's word in you become empty? In your mouth. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Our theme is this, God's word is not empty, it will not return unto him void. See, the key is God's word will not return unto him void because it's not empty. But when it's empty in us, why? Because we say, Lord, Lord, and do not do the things he says. When he says, be angry, but do not sin, and we let our anger get the best of us, we we'll wake up half drained, aggravated, frustrated, and all night long we've lost sleep because we thought about all the ways that we could get back at the person that we're angry at. Oh, not me, Pastor. I'm going to bind up that spirit of line. Yes, you. we all have been there. But just because we've been there doesn't mean that we need to park there. Amen? Church, my point in this message tonight to complete it is what the Lord Jesus said concerning everyone who professes him as Lord. It's still true today, especially when he himself addressed the necessity of doing what he says to do. To weather the storms of life and endure to the end of our journey here on earth. If so, if that's so important, why, why are so many of God's people Professing believers doing everything but that. If they say, I, oh, I believe, I'm a saved man, a saved woman, I believe the Lord, I believe that. Why is it that they don't take this to heart? Why is it that all of a sudden we don't think the people of God, believers, whether it be us or some other believer, professing believers, somehow think that God winks at us when we say, not today, Lord. Because you see, we've made God's word empty, not, not God's word to himself, or not God's word in general, because it will never be empty. The only place it becomes empty is in you and I. And that's what this message is about. Empty words produce empty results, but God's word doesn't. When we do what God's word says, when we're not only hearers, but doers of the word of God, we're blessed in that by which we do the word of God says. Oh, hallelujah. Open your Bibles quickly with me to Ezekiel. I thought this was quite interesting. And if you want to know more about it, go to Ezekiel 33, verses 30 through 33. Um, the Lord God was, was talking to Ezekiel concerning the people of God. Again, his people. And, you know, people, it reminded me of this. And that's why I kind of put it down in, in a note for me to go to and share with you. Isaiah, excuse me, Ezekiel 33. Um, I think the, actually primarily talking about the Lord in, in the times to come. As he did uh, when he tried to share the gospel with those of his own hometown. And they didn't believe him so he could do very little there. The word of God says in Ezekiel chapter 33 verses 30 through 32. I thought it was quite interesting. He's talking about, and for you to really get the meaning of what uh, is meant in this, you need to go to uh, the very first part of chapter 33 and read it through. Because he's talking about when people don't listen, his people don't listen to the shepherds that God has ordained when they're speaking God's word. It's not so much the shepherds as much as the word of God. 
You have to understand that. So listen with me. It says here, um, he's telling the people why they're going to experience judgment, why they're going to experience a lot of things in their life that he's not planning for them, simply because they've allowed the word of God to be to them empty words. It's kind of like this, the heart, uh, with the heart you worship me, with your lips you're far from me. Or with the lips you worship me, not your hearts are far from me. I believe it's the way it goes, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing here. It says, also thou son of man, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses and speak one to another. Everyone to his brother saying, and you've done this too, and I have. Come, I pray you, and hear what the word that cometh forth from the Lord is. Well, how many people would say, come to the word, come to the house of God. Come hear the word of God. Let the word of God find a place in your heart. Right? Mm -hmm. It's so, so, same, same, same. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people. Why do you profess me as Lord, Lord, Lord? In other words, you call me Lord, but look what he says here. And they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart go after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument, for they hear thy words, but what? They do not do, or they do them not. And you can read the last verse if you want, but it says, And when this cometh to pass, lo, it will come, then shall I know that a prophet has been among them. And if you read the whole chapter, you understand what he's saying, because when he brought forth the judgments that are to come, it was only for one reason, because his people didn't do what they said they heard and they believed. It hasn't changed. I believe more so than any, anything, many professing believers do just enough to have a just-in-case net. In other words, they were always looking for loopholes to get out of any discomfort to stay in their preferred comfort zones. And brothers and sisters, sooner or later, sooner or later, the Jordan's going to swell. Sooner or later, if you're wearied by the footman in the land of peace, what are you going to do when the horses, what are you going to do when the challenges, as Jeremiah said, when the horses uh, and, and the swelling of the Jordan comes forth and the horses' greater challenges come forth? What are you going to do, my brothers and sisters? What are we going to do? You know, this is not chastisement. This is bringing us to remembrance, understanding. Look, all you got to do, seriously, there's not one avenue of our lives as people that live on this earth, whether it be in our churches, whether it be in our political system, whether it be in our workplaces, whether it be in our school systems, whether it be wherever you are, there is an undermining of God's sovereignty there. There's an undermining, of, believe it or not, of who you, you think that everybody likes you. No, I got news for you. Soon they... They're digging right up underneath the surface of your feet so that when you take a stand because you've neglected the foundation that you are, guess what? You start to sink. You see, everyone, oh, everybody likes me on this and that. No, no, no. When the rubber meets the road. Look, brothers and sisters, I'm not being harsh. I want to remind you about something. The only one that can make a difference in you and I is the one whom we say, Lord, Lord, Lord. But you can say, Lord, 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 all you want. But if you and I do not do what he tells us to do, you are like an unwise builder. You cannot stand against that that is coming. How many of you ever watched the wind here lately? It comes all different directions. That's kind of like the enemy is going to be coming. Right. If you haven't realized it yet, it's not going to meet you man to man or woman to woman. 
No, it's going to be like they are. The enemy is nothing but coyotes. They run in packs. They nip at your heels. They want to weaken you. They want to have you turning all around looking for that that sucker punched you. And I want you to know the only one that can send the enemy, the enemy out seven different ways when he comes in like a flood is Jesus Christ, the standard that is lifted up before us. Amen. And you and I have to understand something. You cannot afford to let your words, the words of God that is in your heart, the words of God that is your covenant become empty words because they produce empty results. And Satan would love and loves for you to talk the word of God. He does. He just doesn't want you to walk in the word of God. Because when you walk in the word of God, that means that the words that you're speaking are no longer empty. They're filled with God's testimony. Jesus Christ said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Father. Everyone. Brothers and sisters, in preparing for today's word, God kept sharing with me over and over again. As he spoke to my heart, he said, Eric, I've laid out the road to victory long ago, yet so many, even many of my people are choosing a different word as we speak and calling it good. Calling it right, calling it my love, and it's not. Is there self-professed truth that is equal to God's sovereignty? But yet people here today in the churches are saying, hey, listen, I don't, I, I don't believe I have to do this. And the question is not whether or not they believe they have to do it. The question now is whether or not they want to do it. Because you see, I never look at serving God as a have to. I look at it as a privilege, an opportunity. Because I couldn't do it before. You see, the man that I was could not serve God before because I wanted to serve myself first. And that's the difference between someone who professes to love the Lord and somebody who does. Someone who is truly, genuinely embracing the cross and someone who's not. I don't count it a burden. The Word of God says in Matthew 7, 13 and 14 that Jesus Christ professed the truth that hasn't changed and yet people don't even want to look at that. He well said this. He says, When every man's day comes before me, they will find themselves on a broad path. Either a broad path to destruction or a narrow path to salvation. This is the way the Lord put it to me. He said this. The road to victory long ago was what I provided for my people through the cross. Many of my people, though, are choosing a different word as you speak right now and calling it good. But that that they're calling good is self-professed truth and not my sovereign truth. And when their day before me comes, they will find themselves on a broad path to destruction, but not the right path to safety and promise. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now, brothers and sisters, the Lord continued to pound my heart with this message. Last Sunday, He allowed me to bring forth when the touch of God becomes more than a touch, something happens because this message needs to prelude and be interwoven with that message. Because see, nothing happens even when the touch of God, unless it becomes more than a touch, then something happens. Far too many people just want to have a, a good feel good and then go home and do what they've always done. But God's not about a good feel good. He said, I want you to bring 
this truth to the people that you serve over and over again so that when others come to them, the truth that they share will not be empty words because the truth that they share will not produce empty results in their lives. You see, what I'm saying is your words will never be empty if the word of God in you produces a testimony in you. Testimony is not yesterday, sister. Will it be? Testimony is every moment, moment you take a breath. A testimony is every time you have to choose between acting out the flesh or responding by the spirit. The challenge and the overcoming, there's no overcoming unless there's a challenge. The Lord said, while there's yet time, I want you to bring it back to remembrance. To all the messengers of my word. And that's all of you that I'm speaking to you right now. You are the messengers of his word. I'm not. I'm one of them. But we are together the messengers of his word. To speak his truth from the pulpits and on the streets and in, in our homes. When they are facing your own mirror speak the truth foremost to yourself. He said, Eric, the narrow path is still the narrow path and only path to my father. Again, over and over and over. He kept speaking and saying the narrow road and the wide road. I spoke about that for a reason back then. And I'm speaking about it to you for the same reason. Because the narrow road that I speak to you about and want you to remind the people about tonight was bought and paid for through my blood. My father's command on Mount Calvary at the cross that I hung on, I obeyed. When I said, Lord, 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 when he said, Father, 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 the Father said, this is what you need to do. And the Lord God did what he needed to do. In fact, he says that he learned obedience through the things he suffered. Open your Bibles, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 through 9. And then slide over to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. And you can see how they go hand in hand. Praise you, Jesus. Isn't God good? Amen. Just sometime? All the time. Oh, praise the Lord. Are you beginning to hear the word of God and what God is trying to say concerning empty words? Bring about empty results. Amen. Have you ever spoken the word of God and it just kind of seemed like it didn't have no life whatsoever in it? Do you wonder why? Because before it can have life, it's got to have life in you. It's got to make an impact in you. It's got to sow in you. It's got to produce in you. The Word of God says in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, speaking about the Lord Jesus, says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. It means that he obeyed God. He obeyed God. He obeyed the Father. But, but, but Pastor, he is God. Yes, he is. But he is the Son of God. There is an order. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ obeyed what God requested or God asked of him. And what was that? He climbed on the cross. Did he not say in the Garden of Gethsemane, Nevertheless, thine will be done. Not mine, but thine. And did it not say, did it say it was easy for him? To say that? No, it says that it was such a great strain, such great pressure that he sweat great quadrants of blood. So he started actually shedding blood for us, not on the road to Calvary, but in the garden. When his mind had to submit and surrender to obey God. The Word of God says here. And being made perfect, now I want you to hear this, all of you. Everybody wants to argue about salvation, but salvation has fruit. Period. Word of God says here, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that what? Amen. What? Amen. So there's not an empty word there, is there? 
Now, does it mean perfect, sinless obedience? No, it does not. Because there's none of us that are sinless. But it means that we strive. It means that when we sin, that we're quick to repent. It means that when we confess our sins to the Lord, that He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. But it always says that He is the author of eternal salvation unto all those who obey. Empty words produce empty results, but God's Word doesn't. When we say, Lord, 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 you're my protector, then he will say, are you abiding in me? Is your word abiding in me? Well, why would he say that? Because that's the only way that your words will not be empty. If his word is abiding in you, you're abiding in him, then your words will never be empty. But if you're not abiding, and I'm not saying you may say, I love the Lord, I'm saved, but let me ask you something. Are you abiding in his word concerning your anger concerning your mouth? Oh, Pastor, you don't even care how I speak. Really? Show me in the Bible one place and I'll show you 30 places where he addresses our mouths, our tongues, our words. Because the words are a reflection of our soul and they're an overflow of our hearts. No, he wants you and I to understand you're a messenger of his word. You're a messenger to speak. Whether I'm behind the pulpit, one of you should be able to walk right up here and speak the same word that I'm speaking because it's a word of faith. There's only one faith, hear me well, there's only one faith and there's only one spirit and there's only one God. Amen. Oh, pastor, you're in big trouble for saying that. I'm speaking the truth. That's not an empty word. That's a proven fact. Why? Why can you say that? Because I'm a walking miracle. I believe and therefore I speak. Brothers and sisters, he kept on telling me over and over and over again. He said, what more could I have done? Bro? What more could I have done? And that's why Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 is so important. <clears throat> For your words and my words to not be empty words and to remain His words, then we must be continuously renewed in the spirit of our mind, not conform to the world. The Word of God says in Hebrews chapter 12, one more. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now go to Romans 12 for me. And then I want you to go to Ephesians. We don't run out of time. Romans 12, 2. We read Hebrews 12, 2. Now I want to look at Romans 12, 2. It says, And be not conformed to this world. Why is that so important? Because when we conform to this world, even though we have the Word of God in our minds, they're empty. Because we're, we're conformed to the world. Where does the power of the life come from? By the renewing of what? Our mind. It says here, But you be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now go to Ephesians for me. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, it says, This I say therefore and testify of the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Are you with me? Yeah. Why? Why is that so important, Pastor? I mean, that's, I mean, we all, no, no, no. Listen to what God's Word is saying. When we do, what happens is our understanding is darkened instead of being light. Instead of having revelation of God's word, it's darkened. It alienates us from the what? The life of God. 
through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all in cleanliness with greediness. But listen, and this is so interesting. He said, but you have not so learned Christ. In other words, if you are operating like that, then it's because you have not learned about Christ. You haven't had the revelation of Christ. He says, look, if so be that you have heard him, one, he talks about learn Christ, and it turns right around verse 21. If so be that you have heard him and have been what? Taught by him as the truth is in whom? Jesus. What, what happens here? That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. And again, what? And be renewed in, your, in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on what? The new man. Which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And then look how he qualifies it into everyday life. Wherefore putting away lying. First thing. First thing. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one and another. Then he comes back around and says. Be ye angry and sin not. In other words, he's not saying to be angry is a sin, but he's saying to act on that anger is. That's what makes the difference. And sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, and then this is where he comes, neither give place to the devil, and you can read the whole rest of it yourself. What I'm saying is, when we house the Word of God in our heart, it should make a difference in what we say because it is changing our heart. Empty words produce empty results when we don't apply the Word of God first to our hearts. When you and I just pick and choose, when you and I say the Word of God without it producing something in us, those words, no matter what the Word of God says it says it doesn't return void. It doesn't. His Word to Him doesn't return void. The breakdown is what we do with the Word. Amen. Even though you have the Word of God in your mouth, mm -hmm. doesn't mean that it does what God intended it to do. When it's in His mouth, it goes forth to do what it intended it to do. But it has to find a heart that is willing to say, Lord, 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 and do what it means when he say, Lord, 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 obey him. Amen. Are y'all understanding what I'm saying? Amen. Because you see, we many of us have, uh, Sister Jan, we have the word in our mouths and in our heads. And Satan doesn't mind us having it there. It's kind of like when Pharaoh told Moses, he says, hey, listen, I don't mind for you worshiping the Lord. Just don't go too far from me. Well, that's what Satan is saying right now. I don't mind if you go to church. I don't mind if you listen or read devotions. I don't mind if you say, thus said the Lord. But I do mind if thus said the Lord doesn't return void in your life. Too many of us say, the Lord is my healer. Yet we don't trust Him to heal us. Too many of us say, the Lord is our peace. Yet we don't trust Him to give us the peace we need. We want to manipulate everything around us so that we have peace and we say, I knew the Lord would give me peace. No, what happened is you manipulated everything in your favor to get peace, but when it's not in your favor, you don't have peace. So he says, not God. Anybody here? Yeah. I know that's what happens with me. I'm not speaking at you, I'm sharing with you. See, I don't want empty words to be found in my heart because what's in my heart is God's word. So if there's empty words in there, and I made God an empty word, God's word empty in my life, in other words, it's not producing what God's word says it's going to produce in my life, then I'm actually saying that God's word doesn't work for me. And it does, Brother Brian. When it works and how it works, I don't know. But I know that it has a point in a time, a season, or two words. Open your Bibles, if you will, to Isaiah. Isaiah, this is important. If you don't hear anything else when I come to a close, hear this, because this is what I believe is so important for us to really hear what the 
the core of this particular message. Empty words produce empty results, but God's word doesn't. How many of you know that God is not going to do anything more than he's already done to save man? Is that true? You mean to tell me that God is not going to uh, fix this world to save man? No. God is not, not going to do this to save man? No, he's already done what he needs to do to save mankind. Point made is in Isaiah. When God spoke through Isaiah in chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. He says, now will I sing to my beloved a song of my beloved, touching this vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard in a very fruitful year, hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. This is God the Father talking about Jesus. The choicest vine is who? Jesus. Look what he says here. And he fits it and gathered up the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and brought and it brought forth wild grapes. What Jesus has done for us should have brought forth grapes. Should have brought forth good fruit, in other words, not sour fruit. Look what he says here. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. This is so powerful. What could I could have been done more to my vineyard than I have not done in it? What more could God the Father do to save mankind more so than what he's already done? He says, when I looked, then it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. He says, what more could I have done? He said, well, Pastor, how does that relate to what Christ did? Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Word of God says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you empty words, the gospel. That is the word that God the Father sent that is not empty. He said, which I preached unto you, and that's what I'm doing right now. I'm reminding you of who you are. I'm reminding you of the character that's being built in you. I'm reminding you of the words that come forth. I'm reminding you of your accountability and your responsibility as I am myself to preach the word of God and the full counsel of God's word. So that your words are not empty. So that your words return unto you, not void. Even when you speak to someone and they don't hear you, they don't want to listen to you. Those words, because they have changed you. Those words, because they are changing you. Those words, because they're bringing life to you, will never be empty in you. It says here, I declare unto you the gospel which I have preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He arose again the third day, according to Scriptures. Boom! What more could He have done? Church, what Christ has done on the cross is defeated the enemy completely in Christ has the victory, but Satan hasn't surrendered, yet at least not to us. The battle still must be fought on the field of life, 
And it must be walked out by us if we're to truly be the head and not the tail. If we're truly to be the recipient of the victory that God's word says we are. If we're truly to have God's word not be empty words in our lives. Because God's word doesn't and isn't empty. The only one that makes it empty is you and I. When we say, Lord, 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 and don't do the things he says to do. The Bible says that Jesus said, and I'm almost finished, so bear with me. He said to them, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross, his cross daily, and follow me. How many of you don't understand that? How many of the professing believers don't understand that? Does it not say, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. All that simply means, as I said Sunday, is to put Christ first. That's all that means. Doesn't mean that you have to whip yourself. Doesn't mean that you have to beat yourself. Doesn't mean that you have to, 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 to take all the food out of your icebox and throw it away and just have a morsel of bread. That's not what it means. It means put him first. Seek ye the kingdom of God first and his righteousness and all things should be added unto you. And then he says, take up your cross daily. So you can't take up your cross daily until you first deny yourself. And then last but not least, he says, then follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged? He gained the whole world and lose himself or be cast away. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me in my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father and of the holy angels. You know, brothers and sisters, I've heard many teachers and teachings on the authority of the believer, and I truly believe what God's Word says. I've studied the Word and read many commentaries and will continue to dig in deep, rightfully dividing the Word of Truth in prayer and yes, fasting. But no matter how deep I dig, as I shared with brother earlier, and no matter how much I study the standard truth for overcoming and for God's word not being empty in our lives, without, without any, any arguments on my part whatsoever, no matter who wants to argue, for us to withstand the assignments against us, as well as holding on to the promise of God, we must always be turning away from iniquity. We can't be embracing iniquity in any form. Repentance must be followed by obedience. Everyone that talks, and again, what I told Brother Bright, everyone talks about the seal, once saved, always saved. I don't buy that. I believe in blessed assurance, but not once saved, always saved. I know a lot of people want to argue about that and this and that, and I'm not going to argue about it. I know what I believe and I know what I preach and I know what I teach because that's what God's Word says. But I will say this, the Bible says the assurance that God has stamped on a believer's life is when a believer turns away from iniquity. The Word of God says in 2 Timothy 2.19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands assured, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His. The same thing that I read to you in Psalm 1. The Lord knoweth those that are His. And He said, And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's what I shared with you in Psalms 1, verses 1 through 6. And it supports the epistle of 2 Timothy 2, 19. So no matter what, brothers and sisters, no matter what scholars talk about, no matter what the mentalities of today's platforms are, our rising theologians may rise up and say they will never redefine or minimize the truth of God's Word, even if people don't believe it today. When they die, one day they will when it is all said and done. But unfortunately, far too many will know it on the wrong side of the cross. See, God is not harsh, but He is just. And He's not a respecter of persons, but He is a respecter of His Word. 
A lot of people don't believe that, and that's why this message is what it is. Empty words produce empty results, but God's word doesn't. God's word never produces empty results unless the place that he's sown it doesn't obey it. And it's not that God's word produced something empty, it's that the soil did not cultivate the seed. Church, let me say this. It's not enough to ask God to open your eyes to see the enemy and to know their plans against you without preparing yourself for and in spiritual warfare for victory. If you and I plan to defeat the enemy, then the touch that is more than a touch and that's something that happens enables you to have the revelation that goes deeper than where you were yesterday. If something is coming against you and prospering against you, then go back to, to um, Isaiah 54, verses 14 through 17, and tell and see what it says. If something is prospering against you in your peace department, go back and see where you have let play, uh, Satan have place in your life. You say, Pastor, I'm not perfect. Amen. But God is. And his word is. Church, if you and I plan to defeat the enemy and their plans, it must not be for short-term relief. It must be for long-term. Yes, one day at a time, but the same way. The man of God daily. You must seek the man of God daily. And write these down for your studies, as we are out of time. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 6. John 6, 47 through 51, part 8. Philippians 3, 13 through 16. And 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. Can anybody tell me why the people in this world want to argue so much against you? Is it just because they're angry, Sister Nell? Is it just because they're mean? No. Do you believe that there is a God in this world that is not God? His name is Satan. It's with a small G, but he still controls the, the world's philosophies. And you see, that's what the Word of God well says. In one of those scripture verses that I just shared with you. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4. It well says that the only reason. Again. Empty words produce empty results. But God's word does it. So if you share the word of God. And, and I, I am going to close. So bear with me. If you are sharing the word of God with someone. And they just don't want to receive it. And you say, but Lord God, your word is returning empty. It's not. Because it's coming back to you. If they don't receive it, look what the word of God says in verse 3 of chapter 4, 2 Corinthians. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are what? Why are they lost? In whom the God of this world, small g, had blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine unto them. Verse 5, just for your lanyard. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus Christ. I leave you with this. The Bible says this. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 9. 25 through 27. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they that do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Therefore so run not I as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Now listen to this. This is what I wanted you to hear. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, 
lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Our enemies are real and their challenges are real. And that's why we can't afford to let our words be empty. Because God's word's not empty. And that's the only word that we should have in our hearts. Truth be told, we have to decide whether or not we're going to allow God's word to have the final lot and tittle in our hearts. Truth be told, we need to speak the word of God. And when we speak outside of the word of God, we need to shut our mouths and bite our tongues. Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Jesus, point blank, was saying, my brothers and sisters, when we do not the things that God asks of us, our words are just that. They're empty words. You see, the Lord spoke to my heart and said, when people call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say, when they do this, our words become just empty words. For the Spirit speaketh, that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Father God, as I close tonight, I'm not going to stand here before you people and tell them it's okay to miss the mark every once in a while. I'm not going to stand here before them and, and tell them it's okay to do their own thing because they're a good enough person. I'm not going to stand here and tell them because there's none of us that is good that we can all just do our own things. As long as we say, Lord, 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 it'll all be okay. I'm not going to say that. For the Word of God says, who despise it, the Word of God shall be destroyed. The Word of God does say there's a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The Word of God does say the ear that hears reproof abideth among the wise, but he that refuses instruction despiseth his own soul. You know, it is said that is that uh, Solomon was the wisest man that walked the face of the earth. And I say that he was next to the wisest man because I know Jesus was more wiser than he was. But as far as that goes. And, you know, when I look at the Word of God in Ecclesiastes, which is the same one that wrote Proverbs, Proverbs being words of wisdom, Ecclesiastes being almost words of, of bitterness because through his vanity he found out some things. See, all his words in Proverbs became empty words to him because he allowed the gift of God in him to explore the vanity of his own nature like many of us do. See, God has given us a lot of gifts. But far too many times when we say, Lord, 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 we've made our words, which are His words, put in our hearts empty because we don't do what He says to do. In the simple things. Let me end with what Ecclesiastes, the preacher said, Solomon. He said, the preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even the words of truth. The words of the wise are as golds and nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further by these, my son, be admonished, 
of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. But he came to this truth of all truths, which kept the word of God in him from becoming empty. He had to rediscover at the end of his life. He said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be Father God, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for your word. I pray, Father God, that the completion of this message still rendered the impact that you wanted it to, Lord. Don't let the words that are in our heart, that we hold holy, the covenant words of God, Lord God, if they're empty in content, it's not because of God, it's because of us. Your word is not empty. So therefore, Father God, the word that is sown in us should never come out empty. It should come out with power and authority. It should come out with life. It should come out with edification. Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus that every one of us that says, Lord, 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 can say that because we do what he says. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. Praise. Give God a word.